For our first type of analysis or kind of summary that we are going to do with our data, we are going to specifically talk about frequency tables. All right, so our frequency tables are a handy way of taking information and summarizing it and being able to see some insights into what the data is telling us. And what's interesting and handy about frequency tables is that they can handle both categorical and numerical data. So uh, we're going to break this up into two parts and we're going to start off first on our numerical data. All right, so there are some differences between how we do frequency tables for discrete and how we handle them for continuous data. So I'm going to break up this into two parts again as well, uh, into our discrete and into our continuous. All right, so let's start off with uh, discrete because it's pretty easy to handle. Okay. So for our discrete data, we're going to talk about a uh, number of shots made at the free throw, free throw line. Okay. Okay. So suppose uh, we we were tracking I don't know Denver Nuggets or somebody, and we were looking at. Um, at a specific player and we are tracking how many free throws they made during each game uh, throughout the season. Okay, so what we would have then is a table that kind of starts to look like this. Let's start off with our first column and this is going to be um, our different, uh, they have a bunch of different names, we could call them classes, uh, sometimes they're called ranges, sometimes they're called bins, um, but up right here I'm going to put as number of made free, throw, free throws. Okay, and I'm going to start putting these down. So maybe it's like some bench player who's coming off the bench. Uh, they don't shoot from the free throw line a ton. And so for the season, maybe it was zero, one, two, three, and four. Okay, so then over the season, you know, there's so many games, and we will say over here, this is known as our count. And we're going to put in a little subscript here. So we're going to have this N sub I, or how many times we saw this for every single uh, possibility. So maybe we saw him over the course of the season in 10 games that he played, he shot zero free throws. In 15, he made one. In, we'll say, I don't know, 20, he made two. And then we'll do something like 10, three, and five. All right, so those would just be the counts of how many games did we see him make zero free throws? How many games did he make one free throw? How many games did he make two free throws? Etc. going down. All right, so that is just known as our count. So the next column over, let me make sure I got enough room. I'll kind of plan this out a little bit. All right, the next column over is our relative frequency. And we're going to put this as little f sub i, or it's how often relatively do we see these things happening. So what we need to know is the sample size. First of all, let's look at n. So let's see how many games this player actually played in. So we can do 10 plus 15 gives us 25, plus 20 is 45, plus 10 is 55, plus 5 is 60. All right, let's just double check I got that, 2, 4, 5. Six. Perfect. Okay. So the relative frequency is really simple. We just take the count and we divide by the sample size. So this first one is just going to be 10 divided by 60. And then we've got 15 divided by 60. We've got 20 divided by 
60, we've got 10 divided by 60, and we've got 5 divided by 60. Okay, now typically when you see these reported, especially from a computer output, you're going to see these reported in decimal form, and that's really what we want. I just don't want to have to deal with decimals as I'm writing right now, but that's how you would calculate them, is just take the count, divide it by the sample size, and that gives us our relative frequency. Okay, now suppose I asked, I pose a different question. I want to know how many times did he shoot two free throws, or sorry, not shoot, but make two free throws or fewer uh, in a game that, that he played in. Okay, well, we can answer this question with another column. So the next column that, that we need, so if this is the count and this is the relative frequency, uh, this is going to be the cumulative count. Sometimes we call it the cumulative frequency. Cumu cumulative frequency or the cumulative count and it's just going to be capital NI and it's going to be the sum of all of the instances from a particular uh, class or above okay so here how many times did you shoot zero make zero free throws or fewer and that would be 10 and then how many did he make one free throw or fewer that would be 25 two or fewer that would be 45 three or fewer that would be 55 and four or fewer is equal to 60. So the handy thing about this is that if you've done it right, the cumulative frequency, or our capital N, sums all the way up to our sample size. So it's a handy check that you can do. From there, we have what's called the cumulative relative frequency. Sorry. And that is done with a capital F and I. Now, it, you'll see some different notations from different, um, different textbooks and things. Anyhow, this is just the format that we're going to be using. All right, so the cumulative relative frequency, just like how the cumulative frequency was the sum of the counts, the cumulative relative frequency is just the sum of the relative frequency. So we can say, what percent of the time did he make two or fewer free throws uh, in a game? Okay, so now what we do is we do, this would be 10 divided by 60. This is going to be 25 divided by 60. This is going to be 45 divided by 60. You get the idea. And at the very end, you're going to get 60 divided by 60. The last one should always equal 1. Okay, so this is how we could take our data and actually do a frequency table. It tells us how often things occur. We can look at individual, individual events. We could look at an event or less, and that would be our cumulative frequency and our cumulative relative frequency. All right, so that's how we would handle it with a discrete piece of data, numerical data that has specific steps, zero to one to two. Okay, so let's kind of put a border here. And now let's do continuous data. Now continuous data has some extra requirements that we have to handle. I'm going to go ahead and just erase this for right now. So specifically, remember with continuous data, the responses can be anywhere in on like the number line. So you know with the weight, I can weigh 180 pounds, I can weigh 180 and a half pounds, etc., etc. Okay, so we have to do what's called binning. And let's kind of take this same idea with basketball. So instead of talking about the number of shots made at the free throw line, uh, let's talk about the number of minutes played. All right, so here's continuous. And we'll do. Uh, and we'll do time, what? We'll do number of minutes, that's fine. Number of minutes played. Now, can you play half a minute in, in the game? The answer is absolutely yes, uh, because time is a continuous variable. All right, but we're going to have basically the same format here. 
we're still going to have these four columns. Okay. Let's go ahead and put in one more. Okay, so we're going to label this guy the same thing. It's going to be whatever we are measuring. So this is going to be number of minutes played. And we're going to say how many games did this happen. So once again, we're going to put NI, FI, capital NI, capital FI. Okay, so this is our count, relative frequency, cumulative frequency or our cumulative count and our cumulative relative frequency. Same labels as over there. I'm going to stick with the shorthand. Okay, so the problem is, is here we're going to have to deal with a bin size. And the reason is, is because unlike over here, the bins were already made. We had zero, everything zeros, everything one, everything two, everything three. But over here, because it's continuous, every single observation technically could have its own individual bin and that doesn't help us out. We need to bin these things together so that we can actually see uh, what's going on and those bins help us tell the story and the, uh, the question often is, is like okay well how big should our bins be? So let's say that this player that his max time or his min time was I don't know two minutes and his max was equal to, uh, we'll say, 15. Okay, so that gives us some clue of where the range should be. I'm probably going to set mine from zero minutes all the way up to 15. So that's where kind of my top and my bottom is going to be. And then what else I'm going to do is I'm going to probably, I think, go in step size of three because it makes it um, so that my bin sizes are pretty good. Let me show you what that does. So we're going to go from 0 to 3 and then here we're going to go from 3 to 6 and then we're going to go from 6 to 9 and then we're going to go from 9 to 12 and then we're going to go from 12 to 15. Okay, so now I've got these bins. Now I could have done the bins of like maybe size 5, 0 to 5, 5 to 10, 10 to 15. That would compress how my summary is done, but that's okay. Like sometimes you want to have it pretty tight. Sometimes you want to have it more expanded. This lets us see more detail. Um, when we tighten it up, it gets to see some more summary. And then the question is, is like, okay, well then what should I do? Should I have a ton or should I have a few? And the answer is, is like you probably should play around with the bin size so that you can see what's going on. If you have too many bins, it makes it so that um, there's like no summary going on. It would just be like a count of one the whole way down. If you have it too small, then you're going to have like all of your measurements in a single bin and none of your other bins will have anything in them. So you just need to play with it and we will see how we can do this with, um, with our computer. Okay, so when we see these, you're also going to see something like this, where we've got this closed bracket and this open bracket. So if we close the bracket it, on this side, it means that we contain zero, but if it's three exactly, we're gonna throw it into the next bin. And we're gonna do it like this, and do it like this, and do it like this, and do it. On the last one, I'm going to put two brackets in, where I say I'm going to also contain it into 15. Now we could open it up, there's lots of theories, and there's lots of different ways. I mean, we could also have a open lower open lower end and a closed upper end of the class. We could do open open. We can, anyways, there's all sorts of ways that we can handle this. I'm going to leave it like this for right now. Okay, so let's suppose for this one as well, let's say that we also did this for 60. Um, for it's, This is the same sample, same sample size. So remember we'd have like two rows of columns or two, uh, sorry, two columns and each of them are different variables. This one would be number of shots made from the free throw line. This would be number of minutes played. Okay, so from here, let's say something that we have like 10, and from here, we'll say we'll have something like 20, and we've got, we'll say 20, and we'll say 10, 
Nope, we'll say five. And we'll say five. I think that gets us to 20. 30, 50, yeah, 60. Okay, so then the process, though, is identical. It's the exact same thing that we did with our discrete. Really, the only big difference between the continuous and the discrete is dealing with these bin sizes. Besides that, the rest, once we get the bin sizes established, everything else is the same. So I'm just going to finish this up real quick. So we, once again, oopsies, 10 divided by 60, 30 divided by 60. Oops, sorry. Nope. That should be a 20. Right. 20 divided by 60, 5 divided by 60, 5 divided by 60. And then over here, 10, 30, 50, 55, 60, and then again, 10 out of 60, 30 out of 60, 50 out of 60, 60, and then 60 out of 60. All right, so once again, basically the, the only difference is, is how you establish these kind of bins or these classes over here. With discrete, they're pretty much handled for you. You can bin them if you want. Sometimes the discrete ones, you have so many discrete values you want to bin them. You can. With the continuous ones, you really have to bin them. And But how we handle the count, the relative frequency, the cumulative frequency, and the cumulative relative frequency is basically all the same. There's nothing different. So remember, at the bottom of this guy, uh, sorry, at the bottom of our cumulative frequency, this needs to equal n, or our sample size. And the last one in the cumulative relative frequency should always equal 1. And that is how we handle frequency tables with numerical data.